Good afternoon. Welcome to the Analyst. We'll be taking up five newspaper articles today from the Hindu and the Indian Express. Before moving on, the handout for the same will be available in the description of this video for your kind perusal. Now, the first article that we'll be talking about is simultaneous elections, for which the central government has set up a panel recently under the former President Ramnath Kovind to explore the feasibility of holding simultaneous elections. The second article is the tussle between the governor and the government, that is the tussles between the de jure head and the de facto heads of the state. The third article is upon road safety, which is an important issue. And the fourth article is regarding the recent Bharti Nyaya Sahita and the inclusion of organized crime also within it. The final article is regarding the applicability of the Hindu Succession Act regarding the eligibility of a child from a void marriage to claim property. The first article is regarding the holding of simultaneous elections. This is important in GS2, Indian Constitution, Significant Provisions, as well as the Representation of People's Act. Now, what is the context behind it? The, a committee has been set up by the central government to explore the possibility of holding simultaneous elections, that is the elections of the Lok Sabha and the various state legislative assemblies, they should be conducted simultaneously under the former president of India, Ramnath Singh Kovind. We'll be discussing what is one nation, one election and what are the benefits, why it is needed, what are the challenges behind it and a few recommendations and suggestions. Now, Democracy is based on the premise of political accountability. Therefore, elections are the lifeblood of the democracy and hence to ensure democratic principles are upheld, free and fair elections are also needed. Now, Niti Aayog defines simultaneous elections as structuring the Indian election cycle in such a manner that the elections of the Lok Sabha and the various state legislative assemblies, they are synchronized together, they are held together. Initially, there used to be simultaneous elections ever since the inception and the coming into force of Indian constitution. Simultaneous elections were conducted in 1952, 57, 62 and 67. But after that, there was premature dissolution of the parliament sometimes as well as some state legislative assemblies due to various regions. Therefore, simultaneous elections could not be conducted. Now, what is the need for simultaneous elections? Why this debate is in picture? We'll look at it from various perspectives. When we look at it from the governance perspective, usually the model code of conduct, that is the MCC comes into force as soon as the election schedule is announced. And when there is an MCC in force, new welfare schemes, they can't be introduced by the government to ensure there is a parity without the approval of the Election Commission of India. Likewise, various issues including transfers, appointments, etc. They also need the approval of the Election Commission of India to ensure that the elections are conducted freely and fairly. Therefore, the normal working, the normal governance, it comes to a standstill at times and it leads to even a policy paralysis. For example, the star campaigners like the ministers of the central government, ministers of the state governments, they are often busy in campaigning and it affects the democratic functioning. Likewise, the district administration there also, there is a usage of manpower in ensuring that the elections are conducted smoothly. When we look at it from a legislative point of view, if there are elections being conducted frequently, it will lead to a kind of a logjam or often disruption of the houses of the parliament also because every political party naturally wants to be in the spotlight and wants to raise the various issues which are of essential importance. Economically looking, holding elections frequently, it leads to a massive expenditure and it adds to the burden on the exchequer of the state and it even leads to corruption also. Therefore, simultaneous elections can lead to removal of these wines. Plus, there is often an aggravation of various wines when there are elections conducted frequently. For example, communalism is observed to be usually at its peak during the election time. Vote bank politics is being practiced. Then certain unpopular decisions, they can't be taken. The decisions which are needed for the long term interest, they can't be taken up if there are frequently elections being conducted because 
whenever the elections are approaching, the political parties, the politicians, they naturally want to distribute the freebies rather than take up the structural reforms. To ensure that structural reforms are taken up, a stable government as well as a stable governance is needed. Plus, the simultaneous elections, this will lead to a reduction of the policy indecision and the focus of the political parties, the leaders will be on the policy issues rather. Now, there is a criticism also for this. When we look at the articles 85 and 174, they mandate the constitution requires that legislature should continue for five years unless it is dissolved earlier. But if there are premature dissolutions, then elections also have to be conducted within six months of the dissolution. When we look at the political realities, there are naturally untimely dissolutions also before that five year mandate. For example, sometimes Article 356 is enforced, that is, there is constitutional emergency imposed in a state. Likewise, sometimes the PM, the Prime Minister or the Chief Minister, they also advise the Governor or the President to to dissolve the parliament or the state legislative assembly and at times even a no confidence motion is also passed. Then there is an accountability issue. For example, if there are simultaneous elections, elections will be conducted once in five years only. It might lead to affecting the voters right to exercise his choice. That accountability will be limited and that limiting the chance to express his displeasure or voice his opinions against the activities of the government it can serve as an obstacle against the democracy. Logistically speaking, there is a dearth of security personnel also at times if simultaneous elections are conducted throughout the country at the same time and even maybe dearth of EVMs too. And there will be a focus more on the regional issues, local issues rather than over the national issues. Plus one major concern is we can't put monetary concern over the democratic principles just because there will be less expenditure involved if there are simultaneous elections. That cannot be a sufficient cause, sufficient reason for holding simultaneous elections if it is affecting the democratic principles. Now, what are certain recommendations? There are some suggestions, for example, the Law Commission of India in its 170th report observed that elections to the legislative assemblies and the parliament, they can be held together if the term of the legislative assembly is ending either six months prior to the general elections to the Lok Sabha or after it, they can be clubbed together. Likewise, the 79th report on the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Law and Justice observed that we can experiment with a two-phase election schedule. That is, for one kind of legislative elections can be held concurrently with the Lok Sabha elections and the remaining ones can be held midway that is during the midterm of the Lok Sabha elections after 2.5 years. Now for this, the Parliamentary Standing Committee observed that there can be one of the two conditions which has to be met. One, either there is a motion for an early general election that must be agreed by two thirds of the all the members of the House or there should be a no confidence motion passed and which should not be accompanied with a confidence motion also simultaneously, no alternative government also being formed within 14 days of passing a no confidence motion. That is, these conditions were suggested as criteria by the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Law and Justice. There are certain other practical suggestions also which can serve as viable alternatives to the simultaneous elections. For example, the newly elected House, if there is a premature dissolution of a legislative assembly, then the newly elected House that can continue for the remainder of the term of the originally constituted legislative assembly only for the remainder term of it, not for the entire five years from the date of its constitution. Another suggestion can be we can borrow from Germany. For example, there if there is a no confidence motion passed that is accompanied with a confidence motion also that is an alternate government is formed immediately after a no confidence motion is passed. Or we can experiment with the Sweden kind of model or the South Africa kind of model. There it is a proportional electoral system, although these are some suggestions only, which means that political parties are assigned a fixed number of seats in the elected assembly based on their share of the voting. That is how many votes they got in the elections based on that they will be allotted a fixed number of seats in the parliament or in the legislative assemblies. Likewise, another model of proportional electoral system is practiced in South Africa also. These are some of the alternatives. Now, how do we conclude it? What should be our thoughts for it? First, we need to make sure that 
we can't put the cart before the horse. Therefore, the logistical issues which we say that they will be resolved if simultaneous elections are conducted, they are actually subservient to the legal framework. First, the constitution has to be amended so that the articles 85 and 174, they are not violated and the provisions are put in place so that the legal framework that is not violated. Then elections are only one thing. What we need is a stable governance also. And for that, there are a lot of even electoral reforms too, which are waiting in line. They also need to be taken up. For example, there is an issue of transparency of funding that has to be taken up. Then paid news on polls prediction, they also need to be taken care of. And one candidate, he should not elect contest from more than one seat. Such reforms are also suggested. And most importantly, the women reservation bill, which is still in limbo, that also need to be taken up. These reforms have to be taken up simultaneously or not through a piecemeal approach rather. Now the next article is regarding the governor versus government. There is a fresh friction in West Bengal and Bihar. This is important in GS2 for the functions and responsibilities of various constitutional bodies. Now what happened in West Bengal and Bihar is West Bengal governor decided to discharge the duties of the interim vice chancellors of all the universities where full-time VCs were yet to be appointed. Likewise, in Raj Bhavan in Bihar asked the VCs, the vice chancellors of the state universities to take orders only from the governor. So such clashes, they are often visible between the governor and the government, not only at the state level, but even at the central level also. For example, we'll take up one example here, like in Maharashtra, there the governor called for a trust vote. Although the trust vote did not happen because Thakare resigned even before the trust vote could be conducted. But there were no reasons based on the objective material to conclude that there is actual loss of confidence of the elected government in the house. Without any objective material, the governor called for a trust vote. Although the uh, Supreme Court observed that this is not legal, this is improper, but the status quo ante could not be restored because the CM Thakre resigned even before the trust vote could be conducted voluntarily. Now we'll talk about two judgments which are giving good reasoning regarding how the governor should act. One is the Nabam Rabia versus the Deputy Speaker judgment of 2016. Here what happened in Arunachal Pradesh is, in Arunachal Pradesh the governor arbitrarily rescheduled the session of the Legislative Assembly to one month earlier than the original schedule. And there the Chief Minister of Arunachal Pradesh failed to prove his majority and subsequently Article 356 was imposed in the state. Now there the Supreme Court observed that this unlimited, unrestrained discretionary powers which are exercised by the governor, they will be antithetical to the autonomy of the states. The governor does not have unfettered, unrestrained discretionary powers. There must be some system of checks and balances. If the governor is acting only guided by the interest of the uh, center, then it will be affecting the autonomy of these states. Likewise, the Supreme Court observed that the discretionary powers as observed under the Article 163 subclause 2, that is also subject to the judicial scrutiny because the governor is not an all-pervading super constitutional authority. He also has to act as per the design of the Indian constitution. Otherwise, it will lead to an embarrassment to his office. Even it will lead to a thrashing to the constitution. That is what the Supreme Court observed. That is regarding the governor acting in his discretion with respect to the dissolution of the state governments. Another judgment is regarding the tussle between the governor and the center also. For example, in the BP single versus Union of India, this judgment is regarding the removal of the governor by the president when the governor is not acting as per the whims and fancies of the central government. There the Supreme Court observed that the removal of the governor that cannot be based upon the will, the whims and fancies only without assigning any reason. The cause must be shown before the governor is removed. 
if it is happening apart from the usual five year term of the governor the decision of removal of governor that cannot be arbitrary it cannot be malafide it cannot be capricious it cannot be unreasonable only in rare and exceptional circumstances the usual five year term of the governor that should be changed then there should be certain compelling reasons also plus this decision is subject to constitutionalism the constitutional principles they have to be upheld at any cost then sarkari and punchi commissions they also recommended that the exercise of discretion by the governor that must be tested on the touchstone of objectivity even the governor when he is acting in his discretion he must also act objectively now the third article is regarding the road safety here the author is saying that in the g20 agenda road safety has not been given as much importance as it deserves this is important in gs3 that is infrastructure and roads now what are the measures taken for the road safety that will be focusing upon and this is also linked to the g20's agenda of economic growth hence it needs importance now the world bank says that india is first in terms of the number of road crash deaths and the injuries in the world india accounts for hardly 1% of the vehicles in the world but it accounts for almost 11% of the deaths which are a result of various road accidents etc therefore road safety is not good in india that's what that report says now what are the reasons of the road accidents let's look at the reasons first one is the road engineering that is not up to the mark there are certain problems for example about 50% of the road accidents are attributed to poor planning poor design poor construction and the operation and maintenance of the roads plus there are certain design problems like lack of separate lanes for two wheelers and pedestrians in the road design there are certain black spots for example sharp corners etc while road designing there are infrastructural lacunas also like there is an absence of overpasses underpasses and even alternative roads are not there for the village traffic therefore the fast moving vehicles on the national highways etc they compete with the slow moving local traffic too the vehicular condition also is contributing to the road accidents related deaths for example the global ncap ratings etc that is poor for even the top rated cars in india there are human errors for example not wearing a helmet etc post accidental care is poor in india for example now though we have even initiated the good samaritan law also to ensure that there is protection available to people who are coming forward and willing to help those who are victims there is over speeding lane indiscipline while driving jumping the red lights negligence and congestion etc such issues lead to the road accidents now what are the interventions the steps that the government has taken up to reduce the road accidents to improve road safety in india one is the motor vehicle amendment act 2019 this act has amended the motor vehicle act of 1988 it has hiked the penalties for traffic violations it has hiked penalties for juvenile driving defective vehicles etc also a motor vehicle accident fund has been constituted which ensures that there is a compulsory insurance cover which is provided for all the vehicles and the national road safety board is also constituted which will advising the government for improving road safety in india even kerala and gujarat they have local level bodies also that is the state government level boards also for the road safety and there is a recall of vehicles the government can order the recall of any motor vehicle if it is having such a defect which can cause maybe environmental damage or the damage to other drivers or other road users and good samaritans they are provided for protection under the motor vehicle amendment act the other initiatives for improving road safety in india include one is the national transportation policy it establishes a planning framework for the road transport and a sustainable development of road infrastructure then there is a road safety policy to promote awareness and to establish there is an information system a database and it will encourage a safer road infrastructure there are road safety audits also which are conducted and the bharat mala pre yojana that is aimed at improving the efficiency of the movement of both passenger and freight transport because that will help in filling the infrastructure gaps in transport there is usage of technology that is there is a plan to reduce the road accidents by 50% 
by 2024 through the adoption of artificial intelligence and predictive analytics. There is an advanced traffic monitoring system also that is a technology to capture the number plate of the vehicle so that it can be captured and penalties can be imposed and there is adherence to the traffic rules which is ensured through this. There is a database that is an integrated road accident database and for the training purposes acknowledging that there is a shortage of drivers in India the government has even planned to set up 2000 driver training schools especially in the backward districts. There are certain international conventions, international agreements also for improving road safety. For example, one is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It provides for two targets for improving road safety. One is the target 11.2, which ensures that there should be access to safe, affordable, accessible and sustainable transport systems for all, improving the road safety. Target 9.1 aims at developing quality, reliable, sustainable and resilient infrastructure including through investments in the transport infrastructure. Then the Brasilia Declaration on Road Safety by WHO in 2015, it aims at bringing down the road accident related deaths by half by 2020. The SDG 3.6, the sustainable development goal that is sought to be achieved by 2030 and India is a signatory to this declaration. Road Safety 2.0 that is a project by the World Economic Forum that aims to introduce technology into the four E's of road safety that is the education, engineering, enforcement and emergency care to ensure that the road safety parameters they are up to the mark. The United Nations Road Safety Collaboration also ensures that there is an informal consultative mechanism that is put into place to ensure that road safety can be improved. Now the next article is regarding the weakening of laws guardrails. This is actually upon the organized crime and its inclusion in the Bharti Nyay Sahita, the improved version, the proposed amendment to the Indian Penal Code. This is important in GS3. Now the Bharti Nyay Sahita brings organized crime within the chapter 6 of the new code. We'll be focusing upon the organized crime here. What is the definition for it? A few examples and how it is dealt with by certain special laws in India and how now under the new Bharti Nyay Sahita code it is proposed to be included within the general provision. Now the organized crime is like a challenge to the law and order situation. Certain activities like drug trafficking, extortion, human trafficking and money laundering can be perceived to be coming under the organized crime. The UNODC, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime defines organized crime as a continuing criminal enterprise that rationally works to profit from illicit activities that are often in great public demand in its continuing existence is maintained through corruption of public officials and the use of intimidation threats or force to protect its operations. There are certain examples let's try with the to understand this with the help of those for example the D company the Daud company that used to operate in India likewise there is Mafia Raj in various states for example there is Sand Mafia in Uttar Pradesh there is coal mafia in Jharkhand. There is land mafia in Maharashtra. Likewise, human trafficking, etc. Such are the examples of organized crime because they need the contrivance, the coming together, the intention, the common intention of various parties, which are the culprits. Now, the National Crime Record Bureau NCRB says that 50,000 cases of organized crime were registered in India in 2020, almost 10% higher than the previous year. Therefore, it needs to be taken care of. Before moving ahead, let's also understand the distinction between the traditional organized crime and the non-traditional organized crime. When we look at the activities, the illicit liquor trade, betting, gambling, extortion, etc. These are traditional organized crimes, whereas the non-traditional organized crimes include money laundering, circulation of fake currency, hawala transfer, cyber crime, etc. When we look at it from the point of view of structure, the traditional organized crime was hierarchical, 
वेर एज दी नॉन ट्रेडिशनल ऑर्गेनाइज क्राइम इट इज ऑफन मोर डिसेंट्रलाइज देर आर इंडिपेंडेंट यूनिट्स विच आर ऑपरेटिंग इन कंसर्ट वेन यू लुक एट दिस स्कोप द ट्रेडिशनल ऑर्गेनाइज क्राइम यूज टू बी लोकल और रीजनल वेर एज द नॉन ट्रेडिशनल ऑर्गेनाइज क्राइम इज बिकमिंग मोर एंड मोर ट्रांसनेशनल इन नेचर एंड देर फोर इट इज डिफिकल्ट टू कैच दोज कल्प्रिट्स द ट्रेडिशनल ऑर्गेनाइज क्राइम यूज टू बी लेस सोफिस्टिकेटेड एंड द नॉन ट्रेडिशनल ऑर्गेनाइज क्राइम इज मोर सोफिस्टिकेटेड इन नेचर now what are the steps taken by the government for example now organized crime is being incorporated into the general criminal law without the adequate safeguards for example the bharatiya nyay sanhita tries to incorporate it we'll talk about that earlier there used to be special laws for it what special laws for example the maharashtra control of organized crime act and the prevention of money laundering act then nia was set up in 2008 after the mumbai terror attacks and its specific focus was on investigating cases of terrorism and organized crime when we look at the international cooperation sharing of intelligence and conducting of joint operations that is being done and india is a member india is a signatory to the un transnational convention against transnational organized crime which india signed in 2008 for asia pacific region specifically also india signed the convention against the transnational organized crime in 2013 there are bilateral agreements also to share intelligence to share information and to conduct joint operations and various international initiatives india is also a member of various initiatives like fatf the financial action task force whose main focus is on curbing money laundering and terrorist financing plus there are various measures taken up to strengthen the law enforcement for example measures to improve the capabilities and integrity of the law enforcement agencies including training technology upgrades anti corruption measures etc they have been initiated now there are certain challenges to an organized crime for example the lack of a specific law which the government is now trying to address which this article is also now trying to explain bhartiya nyay sanhita includes a designate definition of the organized crime but it is vague it is poorly worded and it is overly inclusive because it encompasses a wide range of offenses committed by three or more individuals and does not provide clarity on what constitutes organized crime the definition is not exhaustive it is rather over inclusive whereas earlier it used to be uh, taken up under the makoka that is maharashtra control of organized crime act that had procedural safeguards also including approval requirements for recording information about organized crime qualifications for judges in special courts and the authorization for wiretaps etc but these safeguards are usually not there in the general laws specific laws usually contain procedural safeguards when prosecution is conducted for the commitment of a specific crime there is an anonymity of leadership also because it is difficult to identify therefore it is difficult to prosecute the people who are behind the organized crime plus there is a lack of resources for example the police is under resourced often and often even ill equipped to deal with the organized crime and there is no central agency to deal with the organized crime to tackle the organized crime and therefore it becomes difficult to coordinate the efforts of different law enforcement agencies plus the transnational presence of the various units the various members of the entire syndicate of the organized crime leads to difficulties in joint operations also and in nabbing those ultimately now what is the way ahead we need a comprehensive strategy we need to not only treat it as a law and order situation we need to address the root cause also the root cause for example improving the levels of education reducing the levels of poverty and ensuring there is employment generation so that there is less the organized crime is less enticing then legal reforms are needed to strengthen the legislation procedural safeguards should be put in place and penalty should be higher to discourage organized crime community engagement should be taken up the awareness campaigns community policing for example in bastar the sp of bastar took up an initiative amcho police amcho bastar etc so involvement of community can help in bringing down the organized crime also international cooperation and the uses of technology and intelligence these will serve as the way forwards too the next article is regarding whether a child born from a void marriage can claim ancestral property or not this is important in prelims
Now, the context here is the Supreme Court has recently given a judgment that a child born out of a void or voidable marriage can inherit the parent's share in a joint Hindu family property governed by the Mitakshara law. Let's take up a few of these things and understand the terminology which can be asked in prelims. The Supreme Court said that such a child would not be entitled to the rights of any other property of any other person in the family only for the parents. Now the judgment is using terms like voidable and void marriage. A void marriage is the one which is void from the very inception. Voidable marriage is the marriage which is voided through a decree of nullity etc. Which is voided through a decree essentially. And the Mitakshara law of succession, it usually governs the Hindu undivided families but it is applicable throughout the whole of India except West Bengal and Assam actually. Now when we are ascertaining the inheritance of a child born out of a void or voidable marriage, the first step is ascertaining their parents exact share in the ancestral property. For that a notional partition has to be done of the ancestral property. What is notional partition now? It means how much of the property the parent would have got immediately before their death. Using that it is calculated how much share the child should inherit. Now how did the Supreme Court justify that the child born out of a void or voidable marriage should be allowed to have a share in the parent's property? It used the logic of the section 16 of the Hindu Marriage Act. Hindu Marriage Act section 16 has statutorily conferred legitimacy to the children who are born out of the void or voidable marriages. Section 16 sub clause 3 even explicitly says that they should also have a right to the parents property. So borrowing that logic from the Hindu Marriage Act and using it in Hindu Succession Act also, the intent of the legislature that has to be considered while interpreting the provisions. The intent of granting legitimacy should also be reflected when you are trying to interpret another statute that is the Hindu Succession Act which governs inheritance. Therefore the children who are born out of the void or voidable marriage they are also to be considered within the ambit of legitimate kinship. Now after the Hindu also the judgment observes a couple more things that is after the Hindu Succession Act the succession can be through both means testamentary or interstate succession that is it can be through a will also, a testament also or it can be interstate also that is naturally after the death of the person and also equal rights of succession should be given to both women as well as men post the implementation of the Hindu Succession Act 2005. Earlier the devolution of property used to be only through survivorship. Now it is through both testamentary and interstate succession. These are the observations through the Supreme Court judgment. Thank you.